Hi, this is Bradley Compton, instructor for LNI Sci 120 Information Technology Ethics for the School of Information Studies at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. This is the fall 2011 semester writing critical thought and analysis lecture. Today I'm going to talk about critical thought and analysis, validity and soundness, necessary and sufficient conditions, fallacies, and writing pointers. I recommend all my students read Tavani Chapter 3, the Tavani textbook and from uh, Ethics and Technology, and the documents in the course content section, Writing Pointers, a rule book for arguments, and this is available in the course content of the course website. These are, these are just recommended readings, they're not required. I want to start off by saying that due to the necessity of critical thought and analysis in this course, we engage in debate and some students interpret me doing that in the class or in comments on assignments as kind of bulldozing over their ideas and, and opinions or perspectives and just pushing my perspective on them. And this isn't true. I mean, I do have a I do have opinions on this stuff and that comes out a lot, but even if you share my opinion, I'm going to challenge them because I I do that with my own positions in this material because this is the nature of what we're talking about. We're talking about ethics, we're talking about theory, we're talking about things for which there is room for debate. So think of it as a way to strengthen your position if you feel strongly about it. Uh, I you know I, I do that and it, this is this carries over this is a transferable skill to to other areas of your life like if you are giving a, a proposal at work or preparing for a job interview if you think ahead of time of what the questions you will be asked will be if you are ready for challenges and humbly acknowledge your the weaknesses in what you're saying and then support it saying you know, despite this weakness such and such then you will have a much stronger position you will be able to more authoritatively uh, present it. In this course we use theory and meta theory to analyze topics relevant to information technology information professions and the digital age. I know this isn't an English or philosophy course, but critical thought and analysis is the only way to fully appreciate the nuances of what we're talking about. So it's equally important to the topics. That's why I emphasize it as part of the curriculum. That's why I make comments on it in every assignment you have, whether it's you're lacking in it or you're demonstrating good critical thought and analysis. And just knowing what these issues are, just teaching you the subjects in information ethics would be kind of like teaching calculus and only teaching you to memorize problems without solving them. Furthermore, writing is necessary, good writing is necessary to communicate the ideas and demonstrate that you understand them. And again, that's all of this is transferable to other areas of your life, and so that's one reason I feel it's so important. I, I'm not trying to create scholastic hoops to jump through. I'm not trying to shove academia down people's throats by by pushing good critical thought and good writing. All of this is important for your lives. It makes you better informed citizens. And it's necessary, especially for, for a course like this. So let's begin. Critical thought and analysis. How do I define that? I'm going to make a comment again in your assignments, either you're demonstrating good cr critical thought and analysis or you aren't. I define that by, if you don't remember anything else from this lecture, remember this. Critical thought and analysis to me is giving a statement, a thesis, a proposition, providing a counter argument to that, responding to that counter argument, doing this a sufficient number of times, and then drawing a conclusion. So make a statement, provide a counter argument, respond to the counter argument, do this number of times, then conclude. Think of it as like what goes on in a courtroom. 
You have two attorneys. They develop theories. They anticipate counter arguments from their opponents and are prepared for those to strengthen their case. And at the end, they make a summary conclusion. Arguments follow this basic format of premise, 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 conclusion. The premises are statements, propositions. Two of the most rudimentary criteria for assessing arguments are validity and soundness. An argument is valid if the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. If the premises are true, the conclusion must follow in a valid argument. So when he, here's an example of a valid argument. Unlicensed music downloading is the same as shoplifting a CD from a record store. Shoplifting is wrong. Therefore, unlicensed music downloading is wrong. This is a valid argument because if it's the case that unlicensed music downloading is the same as shoplifting a CD, and if, if it's the case that shoplifting is wrong, it necessarily follows that unlicensed music downloading is wrong. Soundness. An argument is sound if the conclusion necessarily follows the premise premises and the premises are all true. So if an arg argument is valid and all the premises are true, then the argument is sound. So let's look at this previous example of a valid argument that I think there's a good there's good it, there's a good argument that that argument is unsound because although the conclusion may be true the first premise is untrue or a good case could be made that the first premise is untrue and I'll talk about why in a minute because I, I'll save I'll save this I'll table this for a second and talk about when we talk about the fallacy of false analogy. So another very rudimentary component of argumentation is the notions of necessary and sufficient conditions. A necessary condition is one that must be satisfied in order for a statement to be true, and a sufficient condition, if satisfied, assures the statement's truth. So an example of a necessary condition would be observation of diversity and moral values is a necessary condition of the meta theory, uh, the meta ethical theory of relativism. Belief in the absence of objective moral truths is a sufficient condition for the meta theory of relativism. So observation of diversity of moral values, that's a necessary condition of relativism because relativ relativism was conceived because of this observation of diversity in moral values. It's, it says that, well, because there are these diverse views on moral values, there's really no objective set of moral principles to which we can look to assess morality. We can only look at the individual cultures to uh, and assess them from within those cultures. Belief in the absence of objective moral truths, that's also a sufficient, con uh, a necessary condition of, of relativism, but it's, it is also a sufficient condition in, because if you have a belief in the absence of objective moral truths, then you have relativism. It's, it's kind of synonymous with relativism. But why is observation of moral diversity only a necessary condition but not a sufficient condition of relativism? Well, because you, you can have absolutism and still observe diversity in moral values. An absolutist would just say, despite the fact that there is a diversity in moral values, there is this objective set of moral principles. It's just the diversity points to instances where cultures aren't living up to those values. 